Hello, dear Christians. How are you doing today? Um, Pastor Barry here, Griffin Baptist Church, coming at you with my breaking up of the monotony 2020, the most monotonous year ever, um, with the Valley of Vision prayer book uh, written by the Puritans. So I hope this will be edifying to you today. Before we get started, I just want to remind you of a couple things. First is next week we are going to donate um, gift cards from Coyote Coffee to the teachers at Ambler Elementary School here in Pickens. So please get your special offering in. I'm encouraging everybody, at least with my church, to donate at least $5 for to buy a teacher a cup of coffee. Um, good way to let them know that we love them and that we're praying for them during this time. Also, next month, right around the corner, Fall Festival is almost upon us. Um, Lauren and I, our favorite month, or our favorite season really is fall. We love the fall. We love the weather. We love the leaves and the pumpkins and the holidays and so much of family. Uh, we don't know how much of family and other things we're going to get to be able to do this year like anybody, but we still love that time of year and we're really looking forward to it. At Griffin Baptist, we're going to do our fall festival outdoors in the cemetery like you guys always do. And if you're wanting to get a table for that, you're going to need to get in contact with Laura McLean. So that's going to be on the evening of October 31st this year, which is a Saturday. So please just reach out to her if you want to get a table. Lauren and I will be there working a table, and I know some others that will as well. I encourage you to get involved in that. And please, even if you don't want to work a table, um, or you do, regardless, please donate candy for this event. Um, we're going to need a lot of candy to pass out. So... With all that being said, oh, well, if you're enjoying Valley Vision, something I wanted to recommend to you um, that I thought you might also like, and they've got this, it's a book called The Pilgrim's Progress. It's the second best-selling book ever written, from what I understand. They've also got movies made of it. There's at least four different movies that I'm aware of, of The Pilgrim's Progress, and one of them even is for children, so it's kind of like animated, and it's basically the Christian story of life you know being lost being saved leaving the world behind walking the narrow path fighting with different things like despair and hopelessness even and but the, you know the book even has really cool beautiful art in it i really love the art in the book um but it's it truly is a really great story to read or movie to watch you can watch it as a family or whatever but I, I just wanted to show you this and recommend it to you if you're enjoying the Pilgrim, Pilgrim or the Valley of Vision, because essentially the same sort of time period, same sort of thought behind it. So this morning or this afternoon now, I want to bring you a prayer on contentment. Uh, in America, especially in the West right now, and has been, but everything's getting brought more to the surface during COVID. Um, people are just never content here. They're, they're just never thankful for what they got. It might not be what they want. But they're never thankful for what they got, it seems. We need to be, as Christians, we need to be content people in all things. And just like rebellion, there's only one thing we rebel against, that's sin. And there's only one thing we're not content with, and that's sin. Um, everything else is a great blessing from God to us. So as we read through this old prayer, I want you to hear it. I want you to let it in as you're letting it in. Let it be your prayer as well. Okay? Heavenly Father, if I should suffer need and go unclothed and be in poverty, make my heart prize thy love. Know it, be constrained by it, though I be denied all blessings. It is thy mercy to afflict and try me with wants, for by these trials, I see my sins, and I desire severance from them. Let me willingly accept misery, sorrows, and temptations, if I can thereby feel sin as the greatest evil, and be delivered from it with gratitude to thee, acknowledging this as the highest testimony of thy love. When thy son Jesus came into my soul, instead of sin, he became more dear to me than sin had formerly been. His kindly rule replaced sin's tyranny. Teach me to believe that if I 
ever would have any sin subdued, I must not only labor to overcome it, but must invite Christ to abide in the place of it. He must become to me more than vile lust had been, that his sweetness power may be there. Thus, I must seek a grace from him contrary to sin, and I must not claim it apart from himself. When I am afraid of evils to come, comfort me by showing me that in Christ I am a dying, condemned wretch. But in Christ I am, recon I am reconciled and live, that in myself I find insufficiency and no rest. But in Christ there is satisfaction and peace, that in myself I am feeble and unable to do good. But in Christ, I have ability to do all things. Though now I have his graces in part, I shall shortly have them perfectly. In that state where thou wilt show thyself fully reconciled and alone sufficient, efficient, loving me completely, with sin abolished, O oh Lord, hasten that day. Amen. What a powerful prayer. I want to point out... Um, Six different things that I noticed in this prayer that I want to draw your attention to this morning. And not one of my six, but one, the whole point of the prayer that you need to think about, especially as a Western person, is contentment. Contentment. We live in a culture that wants more. We live in a culture that wants better, best, more, now, here, me, give. Ugh. That's how we are. And that's just not okay. Um, the one thing we should not be content with is... Our holiness. We should desire more holiness, more righteousness, less sin. That's okay. But as far as the temporal, earthly, material things, that is not the sort of people we're supposed to be. So that is something we need to recognize within ourselves. And I think 2020 has brought a lot of that to the surface in a lot of different ways. And we need to slay that giant. Look at first. He said, If I should suffer need or go unclothed and be in poverty, make my heart prize thy love. He said he, he wants to know it. He wants to be constrained by it. And he wants this, though he may be denied all things. Oh, beloved, that we, that we would prize God's love like the Puritan here. That we would prize it and we would, in our suffering, in our poverty, that our prayer wouldn't just be, Lord, give me, but that we would look to the love of God and we would say, Lord, let me even in my needs and my poverty right now let me know your love lord i need to know your love even more so now than than ever before i need to know it lord let your love constrain me this this want this need this poverty that i'm in is running me rampant is turning me all different directions lord i need your love to constrain me so that i don't run off cliffs during this time and i don't run straight off into sin i think we all have need for that right now, don't we? We need to prize God's love. We need to know it. We need to be constrained by it. I wonder how different our homes would function if we were that way, how different our church would churches would function, our friendships, our nations, if we could be constrained and know this as deeply as we should want it. I wanted to look at this second thing that the Puritan said. I think it's really beautiful. It is thy mercy to afflict me. Now listen. It is thy mercy to afflict and try me with wants. For by these trials I see my sins and desire severance from them. Let me willingly accept misery, sorrows, and temptations. You hear this? You hear this? He's, he's crediting God with bringing these things to him that in which he's losing things and being afflicted with other things. And now there are... People in this country, you know, we, we have a build a God business, apparently, in most churches. And we just say, you pick the attributes of God you, you like, and you leave these other ones out here you don't like. You know what? Just ignore those tough passages in Scripture, and just don't pay no mind to those. And you only pay attention to these warm, fuzzy, soft ones. We have this sort of build a God mentality. Not okay. God is who he is as revealed in scripture and we should love him for exactly who he is and not feel the least bit shame for loving him as he reveals himself to be one of the ways that he has revealed himself to be is the god of job now you look at the account of job who lost health lost family members lost property and money and animals chaldeans took so many things from 
from him as far as property goes, animals and whatnot, the Chaldeans. You look at that account, the devil stirs up the wind in the wilderness, and that wind gets his family sick, and he loses his family, right? Well, we, we know more than Job knows even, um, given the text, and we know the devil went up to the Lord and even had to get permission to do anything to Job. He, and the Lord put him on a leash and said, okay, but you don't kill him. The, the devil is a devil on a leash. The devil is essentially God's devil. He can do no more than a sovereign, omnipotent, omnipresent God is going to allow him to do. He is not a God unto himself. He, the, the devil is a creature, just like we're creatures. He's a created being. He's not, he's not anything more. He's just evil. Job, knowing less than we even know with Scripture, Job, when all this has affliction has fallen upon him, what does Job say in his bed? He says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, he could have said, the, the devil stirred up the wind and took my family and the Chaldeans, those, those Chaldeans, I hate Chaldeans. They took all my animals. Cursed be the Chaldeans and the devil, because they take away. No, he, Job gets in front of everything before all things, and Job says what? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. This has come about by the hand of God. This would have never, I could have never lost anything if God would have, because God could have stopped it and he didn't stop it. I, I could have never lost a thing, but all these things have been taken from me. And God is at the beginning of all this, so blessed be the name of the Lord. Job goes as far as to say, though he slay me, even, he was going to praise him and worship him. Though he slay me. Where is our love of God like this in affliction? Where is our love of God like this in hardship? We, in our build-a-bear culture, in our build-a-God culture, we only love a God that gives to us. And only a God that pleases us and comforts us and does what we want and does our bidding and, and our time and in our uncontent state of worldliness the god that makes us content with all of our little worldly passions pleasures and spaces not okay not okay we need to put this to death the puritan says essentially that by the trials that god has in his providence and in his decrees somehow been over that the puritan sees his sins and the puritan says that this is a good thing that so that it is mercy, it is actually mercy that God afflicts him with things. He views it as a mercy because then he can see his sins. And as he gets a greater view of what his sins are, he can then fight those sins and let Christ reign over those sins. So he sees that as a mercy. I don't know the last time I ever heard anybody talk that way. I don't know the last time I ever heard anybody say, man, I just, you know, I got a prayer request, Pastor. I just want to thank God for my affliction, because in my affliction, I am seeing so much of my sin, and so I am understanding better how to come against my sin, and the Lord is just it's such a mercy that I've been afflicted in this way, that I can battle sins in this way and become more like Christ. When's the last time you ever heard anybody say that? I think that is extremely biblical, like the Puritan. We, we got to get a bigger view of these things. We got to get a bigger picture of our affliction. It, it's not just some sort of thing that just sort of happened to you by accident and it happened outside of the control of a sovereign, all-powerful God. It's, it's not just, we think like atheists half the time and then it doesn't surprise me that, that, that it comes into our prayer life and we're not thinking God and seeing God in our affliction. Thirdly, I want to show you something else here. He says, and to be delivered from sin, to be delivered from it with gratitude to the acknowledging this is my highest test, the highest testimony of thy love. Now, see, this is the logical implications that drives the whole, everything else he said. He's saying deliver, delivery from sin is the greatest testimony of the love of Christ toward him. It's not his comfort. It's not a full fridge. It's not designer clothing. It's not a lot of land. It's not the lack of pain. It's what? The highest testimony is delivery from sin. I think he's on to something. I think we've got areas here where we need to bend the knee and repent 
Um, beloved, I don't know the last time you went to church, but let me say Christ died for sin. Christ died for sinners. Christ died to end the rule and reign of sin. Christ resurrects us from a dead spiritual state, brings us to the newness of life, to walk in new ways so that we don't do what? So that we don't sin. So if the cross is the greatest testimony of the love of God toward a sinner that he gave himself, why would we think anything less? That the greatest testimony wouldn't, in part and parcel, flow out through from, it, it wouldn't be an ebb and flow with us being delivered from sin. So if, if it takes affliction to break you from sin, and God's freeing you from the sin that he's bled and died for, then this is a blessing. This is a great blessing. We should thank him for it. We should want this. This is a good thing. Boy, what has happened to Christianity that we've gotten so soft and so pampered? Oh, Lord, don't make me suffer. Lord, don't make me bleed. Lord, don't take any of my stuff from me. Lord, I need all of my comfort and worldliness. Lord, <laughs> we're building, he's building us for the celestial city. He's building us for eternal comforts. All of this stuff, you, it's not even really yours. You know, there was a great Puritan that said, was it Abraham Kuyper, I think, maybe? I could be wrong about it. I think it was Abraham Kuyper. He said that when the Lord comes back, all this stuff that you have or had, that essentially what God's going to do when he comes back, he's going to stretch out his arms over the planet, and he's going to pull it all to himself, and he's going to declare, Mine! Because it's all his! The whole creation is his. Every speck of dust, dirt, and gold, and diamonds, and people, and air, and what? It's all his. It's not yours. It's not yours. It's not yours. That's why he can take it. And it's, he's not wrong for it. The same way, beloved Christian, think. Think. Christianity is not the lack of thinking. Think. God takes life on this planet every day. How is he not a murderer? Because he's the author of it. He is the only one with the right, with the crown right, to take it, give and take it as he wants to. Everything you have is his. It is his crown right as king to take whatever he wants and give whatever he wants to whomever he wants. This country is so obsessed with individual rights. Hey, you, you and I are Christians. You know what I want to see? more people concerned with in the church rather than, well, the Bill of Rights says, beloved, the Bill of Rights can say whatever it wants to say. Look, it is not written and inspired by God. I love my Bill of Rights. I, I understand them. I read them. I took a class in constitutional law in college. I love it. But it ain't inspired script, scripture. And I'm a Christian. Above and beyond my care and concern for my individual rights and liberties is the crown rights of God. I am concerned with the crown rights of Jesus over this planet and over me, which is why I don't just sit there and use the Lord's name in vain during the day and go in my prayer life, well, Lord, I, I know that you think that's simple, but I have a First Amendment right to the freedom of speech. Crown rights of God conceal and constrain my tongue. The crown rights of God conceal and constrain what I do with my property. The crown rights of God conceal and constrain me in affliction. The crown rights of God are loving toward me in their restraint. We as fallen people, you know the one thing we need more of is not less constraint, more constraint. Beloved, the Puritans that we're reading this morning, these are the this is the very people that came over to this country and found it. These are the Christians that George Washington would speak with when he and Thomas Jefferson and all the rest of them when coming up with things like the Bill of Rights. It's the reason why even our founder said these rights, these privileges do not work for a for an immoral unreligious people because an un, immoral unreligious people are what unrestrained christians moral people christian people are restrained we need more restraint and in that restraint we need contentment with how god is constraining us let's get back to this look at number four this is essentially what we're what i just went on about he, he's saying that in this restraint, he wants it replaced with what? He says his kindly rule replaced sin's tyranny. Sin is tyranny. Incontentment 
with the situation that God in his providence has placed you in is tyranny, it's rebellion. <laughs> we need the kind rule of Christ replaced inside of us with this against this sinful tyranny. This is what we, we supremely need. Look at number five. Teach me to believe that if I ev that if ever I would have any sin subdued, listen, I must not only labor to overcome it, but I must invite Christ to abide in the place of it, and he must become more than the vile lust had been. So, so to subdue sin, now this is this is important to you, whoever is listening, and this is important to me too, because you're not glorified, I'm not glorified, this is important to us. We're sinners. We still have sin present in our lives. You still sin. You probably sinned already today. We sin in thought, word, and deed every day. This is important. This should matter to you. We should be fighting against it. We should be rebelling against it. We should not be happy with it. We should not be content with our sin. So then, how do we get rid of it? How do we get rid of it? We must not only labor to overcome it, but we must invite Christ in its place, and Christ must become more than the sin ever was to us. To subdue sin, we don't just fight against it, but we have to have a greater treasure, a greater view of Christ, a deeper love of Jesus than we've ever had for that sin. Now think about this. This is, there, there, is, an, there is an element of impossibility to this. Pick a sin, any sin. Pick your worry. Boy, I... I'm guilty. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a worrier, man. I can worry about all kinds of things. Um, after we bought the house that we live in, we had moved into it, and um, I was walking around the yard, and I was looking at things, and uh, Lauren called me, and Lauren said, hey, what are you doing? And I said, <laughs> worrying? What are you doing? She said, oh, what are you worrying about? I said, I don't know, man. Some of these trees back here are pretty big. I think if this one tree fell, it might hit the house. And she said, my goodness, Barry, really? Are you walking around doing that outside? Yeah. I'm a worrier. It's a, it's a sin of mine that I battle. And COVID hadn't helped me with it. Hadn't helped me, hadn't me get rid of it. I'll tell you one thing, though. 2020 has exposed it more in me I, and it's deeper and it's worse than I ever thought it was and it's caused me to battle harder against it and uh, I'm telling you this to, to so I can give you an example of what the Puritan's talking about here um, and you just need to replace whatever I'm talking about with worry with whatever your sin is I guarantee you whatever it is sin has brought it out greater in you so think about it if I'm gonna get rid of it if I'm gonna fight sin and get rid of it the sin of worry I don't just labor against it. I don't just pray more and look to Christ more. But there is an element in which Christ himself, Jesus, has to become more to me than my worry. Now, what might that look like for you who worry like I do? Well, if you look at your worry, you need to learn to look at your sin to see what the intrinsic characteristics of your sin are. So if I were to look at my worry, I would view it as characteristics of something to do with my control. I'm, I'm trying to control something. I'm trying to uh, sway the outcome in a way like I, I, I'm worried about this and I don't want this to happen. I want this to happen. How can I make what I want to happen happen in this? And so my worry is built in part of I think I know best. I think I have the best idea. I, it's something I'm looking, I'm looking inward to me and what I think, what I want, what I, how I feel and that's causing me to worry because I see a situation that is probably going to maybe go not that way. And that's, I don't, I don't want to have to deal with that outcome versus another outcome. And that could cause me to worry. Um, to fight that, I, I would probably say these things I'm worrying about, like Job understood, nothing can happen outside of the sovereignty of God. He is sovereign. He's not just an old man on a chair, squeaky like this one I'm shit sitting on. He's not just sitting on a chair, um, crossing his fingers, saying, mm, boy, please, 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 I really want this outcome, Barry, please. Oh, Ugh. he's not watching a football game. He is sovereign. 
You know how he knows history? You know how he knows tomorrow? I don't know tomorrow. I, that's part of my worry. You know how he knows tomorrow? He sovereignly decreed tomorrow. He knows history intimately because he's decreed history. Think about that in your word. I lean into that. I push against that. And I would say, well, boy, this worry I have about a tree falling, a tree can't fall unless God allows it to fall. And he, it can't fall any direction at any speed with any amount of leaves on it that God doesn't say okay to. Um, you think of Christ talking about all the hairs on our head being numbered. Not a sparrow falls from the sky without outside of the sovereignty of God. We can't increase, with all of our worry, we can't even increase a day to our life. We have to lean into the sovereignty of God with our worry, his control, his decrees, his providence, and push against our feeble little idea that we might be able to control something. Or our little feeble ideas that we might, we might do control anything. God controls. We need to submit to his control. That'll be the remedy for worry. And then even an understanding something bad happens, Lord, like the Puritan in our prayer this morning, right? Lord, make me content. Make me content. Let this expose my sin. Let this put you higher on a throne in the throne room of my heart. Let this elevate you in my mind and in my life. Let this slay that giant of sin. Christ has to become greater than the sin. Let's battle and exalt Christ. And lastly, this morning, let me point this out to you. This is beautiful, and I think it's simple. And I think for the Christian, we know this to be true. Look, he finds comfort in recognizing his creaturely state and God's godly state. Watch this. Watch what he does here. He, he kind of does a compare and contrast. He says, in myself, I'm dying, condemned, and wretched. Mm -hmm. But in Christ, I am reconciled and live. Oh, yeah. That in myself, I find insufficiency and no rest. Better believe it. But in Christ, there is satisfaction and peace. Amen. That in myself, I'm feeble and unable to do good. Oh, yeah. But in Christ, I have ability to do all things. Amen to that. You see what he does there. The wisest person to ever live, aside from Jesus, according to Scripture, was who? Solomon. You read through Solomon's writings, especially, I think, in Ecclesiastes, you get this sort of, this is his whole point. Why is it better to be in the house of mourning than the house of feasting? Why is it better to weep than laugh? Why are these things better than the other things? Why would it be better to be at a funeral than to be at a feast? Why? I think it's the Puritan gets why. Because there's something about Mourning. There's something about the house of mourning and even funerals and death and th these sorts of afflictions that even he's been praying through this whole prayer. There's something about these afflictions that come upon us in their hardness that remind us of our creaturely state. They remind us of our beggarly state. They remind us of our temporal state. They remind us of the state in which we live in, of our little lack of control and our little ability to do anything. And this is not where we should be uncomfortable. This is where we find comfort. This is where we find ultimate comfort. We go, yes, Lord, I'm so temporal. I need to remember that. Lord, a day, I exist moment by moment. You are eternal. I need to remember that. I don't control anything, really. You control all things. You're sovereign. I need to remember that. Lord, I'm wretched. I'm so wretched, but you're so holy. I need to remember that. Lord, I can't do anything good, anything good on my own. I'm, I'm so sinful. It's all bent and stained and marred over with sin. Oh, but Lord, I, through you and with you, I can do all things. I need to remember that. This is what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, if you remember. Nebuchadnezzar, um, I didn't even plan on talking about Nebuchadnezzar today. Help me convince Lauren to name our first child Nebuchadnezzar, by the way. Hashtag Nebuchadnezzar, name the Von child Neb. Just joking, just driving my wife crazy. Um, Nebuchadnezzar, arrogant ruler, of, was really the ruler of the world at that time of the known world. He was the most powerful man in the world, built so many great things, and 
you watch the story of Nebuchadnezzar, him and all of his arrogance and ego, thinking himself really like a god. God brought him to an animalistic state, did he not? Had him in the field, bear eating grass like an animal. And Nebuchadnezzar comes back from that humbling of God on him. And what is the piece that Nebuchadnezzar understands? He basically understands the omniscience of God, the godness of God, the greatness of God, the creatureliness of himself, the temporalness of himself, the ungodness of himself. This is what he sees at the end of that and is humbling for Nebuchadnezzar. And he needs it. And it elevates God and it humbles him and it puts him where he belongs, way down low. It puts God where he belongs, way up high. And Nebuchadnezzar finally has that right balance. We are not equal to God. We're not running. No. You are creature, creaturely, with a creaturely will, with creaturely affections, with creaturely control. God is God. God is the only God. God is the only person like him. There is no one like God. This is even seen all throughout the Psalms. Who are you, O oh man? Who are you? What are the nations to me? I snort them out of my nostrils. They are dust, standing armies, dust, nothing. Uh, God is God. Praise God. So let me close. Let me ask you, how's your contentment? What are you content with? Do you find your contentment in things? Do you find your contentment in pleasure? Oh, beloved. Do you find your contentment in sin? Are there sins that please you, that you love, that you look forward to, that you find contentment in? Look, don't run from it. Don't run from it if the Spirit of God brought it to your mind. Don't run from it. See it. And in seeing it, bring it to Christ. Bring it to Christ. You may know you're going to fail at it later on today even. Bring it to Christ and say, Christ, here is this sin. Here is the sin I find contentment with and pleasure in. Lord, slay this evil. Lord, afflict me. Bring affliction upon me so that I might see the evil of this sin and I might be rid of it. Lord, and that in this affliction... You may reign supreme in place of it, that you may, I might find more treasure and such pleasure in you rather than in this thing. Oh boy, it's going to take faith to pray a prayer like that. I've always told every church I've ever been at, you want to hear the most godly prayer that I think it sums up all of Scripture, the most godly prayer and the most dangerous prayer. And this should be our prayer. This dangerous godly prayer should be our prayer throughout our whole life. And I'm going to close with this. Be brave enough to make this your prayer. And you better be careful praying it. It's simple. Like Spurgeon said, great prayers are not in length or in grandeur. They're in their simplicity and in their faith. This prayer goes like this. Lord. Lord Jesus. Make me holy. Make me holy or kill me. That's it. Lord, make me holy or kill me. Make me holy or kill me. Make me like you or get rid of me. Make me like you, take me to heaven's glories and glorify me so I can be made like you. But make me like you. That's the heart of a Christian. That's the heart of a Puritan. That's the heart of a holy man or woman of God. I'm going to urge you throughout this day, think of your contentment. Are you so content with your sin even that you don't want to pray a prayer like that? You don't want to die because you want to keep sinning? You don't want to go to heaven because you want to stay in sin? You don't want to be glorified? Be willing to pray that. Beloved, I love you. I'm not a pastor to be here to talk about wall colors or um, debate politics with you. You know what I'm here for, given by God? To be a tool of your sanctification, to be a tool to shepherd you to that city, to shepherd you into that glorious state, to help you battle sin, to mourn with you over sin, to help you overcome sin, to pray with you about sin. This is what God's given me for, and this is what God's given us his word for. Use me for those things. I'm here. Call on me. I love you guys so much. You just holler if you need me, okay? God bless you.